So I'm talking about waste today and primarily plastic waste, although I do get into beer bottles here and there and about how we basically live in a culture where everything has been designed for disposability. Now, I love plastics, and I used to, one of the reasons I became an architect was that I fell in love with this house at Disneyland that was built in 1957 entirely out of plastic. And it had a plastic interior and plastic dishes and plastic everything was in this. And this was the future of plastic. And vinyl and plastics have always been sold by the plastic companies as being really good things. The vinyl companies sit and they say that plastics are safe. They say they're efficient. They're responsible. They're economical, vinyl siding. Durable. But when you actually get down into what plastics really are, uh, you know, you're basically, with polyvinyl chloride or P PVC, you basically, uh, on a special device that includes an asbestos filter, uh, you begin by taking, making chlorine out of salt, and they say, oh, it's just salt, plastic's just salt. And then they mix it with ethylene, which comes from natural gas. Essentially, plastics are solid fossil fuels and we all know that fossil fuels have a carbon footprint. Uh, chlorine with other halogens and bromine are reactive and when you burn these plastics you often get chemicals like dioxin and other poisons. Vinyls in particular are softened with a chemical called phthalates which otherwise it's just hard and it gets in there and phthalates just basically um, soften it. They're not chemically bound, they're mixed into it. And so when the phthalates get out, they're concerns that they also are gender bender chemicals like the bisphenol A. And other health problems. But again, the biggest problem that we're here, we're talking about is the carbon footprint of plastics. Uh, there's a wonderful, plastics are basically again a solid fossil fuel, they're solid energy. And as Vaclav Smil said in his wonderful book, uh, energy is basically the currency of our society. It's what made our society basically explode once we started with coal and then moved on to oil. It is, money is just basically a proxy for energy. And now the oil companies are going like mad at building new pe petrochemical plants to make plastics because they're worried that they're not going to be able to sell as much gasoline for cars and as much fuel for heating because everybody's cranking up efficiency. So they're basically pivoting to plastic. And as a recent Grist article said, you know, our plastic addi addiction is bankrolling big oil. You know, the fracking boom that's going on in the States right now is producing, they look for oil, but what they're also getting is a lot of natural gas on the side. And so they're looking for ways to suck up that natural gas. And one of the best ways is to strip that, turn, take it that ethylene and make plastics about it instead of just flaring it off into the atmosphere, which they're not supposed to do. The carbon footprint of plastics is about six kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of plastic. So it's a lot. Um, and it's, it's, I remember just a few weeks ago, uh, the orange juice that we buy, which we used to get in a plastic, in a cardboard container, they shipped to, they changed it to a plastic bottle. And I went and weighed the plastic bottle and it basically, when you put this, calculation of six kilograms gram of plastic, it would be one bottle to half of my day's daily allotment of, carbon, of uh, carbon footprint. It was that much in that plastic. And the building industry continues to say, as they did here, uh, the material for sustainability, vinyl is integral to achieving green. And they do that by saying, well, the roofing is green, and when you put a green roof on top of it, and the vinyl keeps the water out, so therefore vinyl's green. A few years ago, actually almost a dozen, almost 10 years ago, LEED 
basically said, you know, we should look at plastic. Is it really healthy? You know, and the plastic industry went insane. And the American Chemistry Council is a very, very big lo lobbyist. And they basically got states to say, okay, you can't use lead anymore. Uh, you can't uh, green. They set up a whole new phony green building system called green globes to replace leads for the sole reason that they were really worried about restrictions on plastics. And the industry kept saying, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. Leads sort of compromised a little bit, so they backed off on this. But the Chemistry Council is still out to make sure that nobody ever says no to plastics. But the issue is, then we weren't all that worried about the carbon footprint. We are now. And if you look at what just happened, this is yesterday's headline, that the oil and go, gas goes and follows oil dropped 30% because the Saudi Arabians got mad at the Russians and the Russians are mad at the Americans and they want to drop the price enough so that all those Americans doing the fracking go out of business. And who knows if it'll happen, but that's basically what's happening here. And it's caused this whole crash of everything else that's going on still today as the stock market crashes. Now, a hundred years ago, when there wasn't plastic, we didn't have this stuff. It got reused and recycled. So someone would come around and pick up all the rags, and they'd pick up all the metal, and it was actually big business. My uh, great-grandparents came over, and they were in that scrap business. My father's first job was whenever they heard at the company that a car had broken down, he had to run and go get the batteries before someone stole them because at that time, the lead and the batteries were the most valuable part of the car. And uh, it was big business. Now, I've shown these slides about aluminum before, about how the aluminum industry, for instance, is an example of where we got into this kind of trouble. Before World War II, they developed all this capacity to make aluminum, to make the planes out of aluminum. And so they had to build giant dams in the Columbia and in the Tennessee Valley to make electricity, to make aluminum. And as soon as the war was over, they didn't have any use for aluminum. So they actually held competitions. And I know someone whose father actually won one of these up with uses of aluminum and we'll give you a thousand dollar prize. We get to keep the idea and this fellow actually came up with the aluminum pie plate and he got his thousand dollar prize and other people came up with these ideas for TV dinner. And suddenly you had aluminum that was eating up the aluminum to be something that is essentially a waste product. Similarly, look what happened with coffee and with restaurants. Years ago, when this painting was done, if you wanted a cup of coffee, you basically went and you sat in a restaurant and you had a cup of coffee. And then that cup got washed and then it got served again. If you had a meal, you went and sat in a restaurant and had your food on a plate which got washed. If you were having a Coke, like Tab Hunter, a famous actor from the 50s, you drank it out of a bottle that then got sent back and washed. If you had your milk, it got often delivered by a milkman in a bottle that went back and reused. There was no waste in this system. Today you still see remnants of this, like still there are some old diners around town like this one. But look at beer for again, here we're talking beer. This is one brewery company, O'Keefe Brewery, that no longer exists. That it had breweries in every town in Ontario because beer was put into bottles and had to go back. It was a local industry. And it kept a lot of people busy in small towns all over the world, all over the province. Then, as the road system got better, they started consolidating to where O'Keefe ended up having one giant brewery up near the airport. That's I don't know O'Keefe anymore because O'Keefe doesn't exist anymore. They had enough money to put their name on O'Keefe Center that was downtown. Coca-Cola was the same. Every town had a Coca-Cola bottler where 
they would take the syrup which came out of Atlanta and they would mix it with soda water, they would put it in the bottle and they would deliver it in trucks. Then when you were done, they would take the bottle back for your deposit and they would take it away and wash it and fill it. In these kinds of trucks. In the 70s, in the very first Earth Day, Coca-Cola ran this ad saying, you know, this is the age of ecology. The greenest thing you can do is fill your co have your Coke in a returnable bottle. Then everything changed. The first thing that changed is that after the Second World War, they built the interstate highway system in the United States. And the purpose of the interstate highway was really for defense. It was even called the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. But what it did is it made for really fast communication and transportation <laughs> by truck. And this let the companies suddenly decide, well, we don't need to have individual breweries in town. We can make all the coors for the entire country in one giant factory in Colorado that produces more and is drunk in the entire, in all of Canada. Can make all the beer that in, the, in North America could be made in this one plant. And they centralized production. But centralizing production doesn't work if you've got returnable bottles. It's far too expensive to ship all that glass and it's too expensive to ship them back empty. You had to develop another kind of container that basically was non-returnable. And so here you can see they're actually throwing that can in the lake when he's done. People had no idea. Hey, I'm finished. It's disposable. Let's throw it overboard. They sold all the vendors and all the stores. Hey, if you sell things in cans, you don't have to store the empty bottles and give them back to us. It's much, much more efficient for you and more profitable. And of course, with all of these highways uh, happening, people started going on the road and driving places. And McDonald's started in 1957, and basically it gave you your food wrapped in paper and your cup in a paper cup because they didn't have anywhere to sit down. And you were eating on benches or you were eating in your car, but you had this disposable packaging as you sat down and then people would eat their food and they would, what would they do? All of this, well, this is what I call the convenience industrial complex, and I'll get into that. Dwight D. Eisenhower, a prime, uh, uh, the president of the United States, in his closing speech, uh, talked about the military industrial complex, but he also talked about resources. As we peer into the future, you and I and our government must avoid the impulse to live only for today, plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss also of their political and spiritual heritage. Imagine the President of the United States today saying something like that. And they all promoted it, though, but it's contradicted this idea of throwaway living that they were trying to promote. The other thing is that they invented bottled water. A huge percentage of this waste now is bottled water. Bottled water did not exist 30 years ago. It was something that the industry basically developed, according to this study, because people think it's healthy, regular water's fine. They think it's safe, regular water from our taps is fine. They say it's refreshing. Well, water is water is water. But they convinced us that we had to stay hydrated. They made up the story that you have to have water eight times a day, which isn't true. They convinced us you can't go without your water. You know, I see quite a few people with their own water containers and a few that I'm going to complain about with their disposable containers. When did it come that everybody had to always have something to drink? It's a new ph phenomenon that they basically trained us to, but it isn't true. And what it did, what all of this did, is it has made the plastic production go up 20-fold, so go through the roof. Millions and millions of tons of plastic the vast majority of it going into disposable products. And every time you get a coffee cup, it's got a plastic polyethylene liner so it doesn't leak. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, they just got bigger and bigger and bigger. 
because, and of course, you see this. They're thrown everywhere. They're all over. You see litter on the sides of highways. The biggest source of litter in all of Canada are Tim Hortons cups. And people have to volunteer to go pick it up. Why are we going and picking up Tim Hortons crap? But that's what people are doing. They're volunteering to go do this. And it's everywhere. And it's all pointless. Now, what happened in the 50s when they started introducing all of this disposable stuff is that there was a real problem. None of us were trained to actually put it in the garbage. People would just basically throw it on the ground. And so you'd go for a picnic, and it really would literally look like that end of the picnic because people didn't know what to do with the garbage. So they brought out baskets, the municipality, and they started these campaigns don't forget, every litter bit hurts. Keep America Beautiful was an organization that everyone thinks is like a neutral, uh, beauti beautiful or organization. But what it was, was set up by the brewers and the bottlers and Libby Owens Ford who make the bottles. It was a fake organization basically to get people, train people to pick up the garbage so that they could keep selling us the garbage. And, you know, they had these extensive campaigns, no, don't leave it here, no, don't throw it overboard, to train us to pick up what's basically their stuff. Throw away living. The campaign got more, more if in the 70s, more elaborate. You may remember, have seen this, the funny commercial of the crying Indian, who's really an Italian actor, but they didn't tell anybody that. Um, and what happened also is as we picked up the garbage, the landfills started getting full. There, you know, they started, the cities were basically paying the cost of picking up the garbage and transporting it and putting it into the landfills and the landfills were filling up and the cities started saying, well, how can we do this? We can't do this anymore. We have to change the system. And they wanted to bring in bottle deposits, deposits, uh, like uh, deposits which would ensure that you could take the bottle back and get your money like we do with beer bottles. Well, the companies went insane because the linear process that they were in with the plastic was hugely, hugely profitable. And so they would pay lobbyists and they would run these advertising campaigns calling it a tax. It wasn't a tax, it was a deposit. But this was to convince people that no, uh, it's a tax and we all hate taxes, right? So they fought these bottle bills. And, you know, as this cartoon says, we'll put $100,000 for litter control but, and recycling and then $2 million to market it. Basically, money to convince us that this is the way things should be done. And so now, of course, we all pay as taxpayers for this infrastructure to pick up the separate garbage. We do all this work that we separate our stuff, they separate our stuff, and then we pay our taxes, and it gets picked up, and they say, oh, it all gets recycled. I want to be a bench. You know, this was a campaign from a few years ago. And just from the time we're children, we're taught that recycling is a virtue, that recycling is the greenest thing you can do. You know, everybody makes the recycling trucks and the recycling toys, because recycling is a good thing. Everybody's doing it. You know, I love this stock photo, you know, I'm Superman, I recycle. A survey was recently done and they asked people, you know, what's the greenest thing that you do? And by far the greatest, most important thing was, I recycle. This is more important to people in another page of the study, do I have it here? No, this was more important than uh, climate change, recycling was more important than sustainable foods, reducing energy use. They, we literally had this drilled into our head that recycling is virtuous. Now, I wrote, I originally this headline on the internet was recycling is bullshit, but they made me change that after a while. And basically this was back in 2008, I wrote, let's call recycling what it is, a fraud, a sham, a scam perpetrated by big business on the citizens 
Look who the sponsors are of this recycling America Recycles Day. Uh, Coke, Pepsi, Anheuser Busch, Coors, Owens, Illinois, who makes the bottles. Recycling is the transfer of producer responsibility for what they produce to the taxpayer who has to pick it up and take it away. And it actually increased resource uh, consumption because we all felt, oh, we can buy shit now and it's good because it's recycled. Basically, as, uh, as this woman, uh, Layla, said, you know, basically what it does, what recycling does is it's a validation of consumption. You don't feel bad about buying that plastic water bottle because, hey, I'm going to put it in the blue bin and it will get recycled. It validates our purchase of disposable products. And it was never being recycled anyway. It was being shipped to China. And was, the reason it was being shipped to China is one, the containers were going back empty, so you might as well put stuff in them. And two, for the longest time, labor in China was cheap enough that they could separate the plastics by type. This is labor intensive. Machines don't do it well, so that people would have to pick it apart and look at it. And so at China, the labor was cheap enough. But then as China, grew up in economic power and capacity and labor started doing more productive things, it was really getting to the point that there wasn't the labor force to actually do it anymore. And so China banned it. <clears throat> and this just caused destruction of the recycling systems everywhere around the world, in the UK and in Canada and everywhere because suddenly there was nowhere for the stuff to go. And so it started piling up and we're still doing the recycling, but hardly any of it has any value. There was a, I took this picture also, there was a uh, government shutdown in the US last year. And that meant in federal lands, nobody was picking up the garbage. And it took a day, a day for all of these things just to be covered in garbage, for garbage to be because you saw instantly how this linear economy generated so much crap that as soon as any part of it broke down, we're screwed. And here it broke down for a week, and this is what Washington looked like. We're so dependent in this linear economy of we buy the stuff, we throw it away, then someone takes it away and theoretically recycles it, but we now know they don't. And, you know, because somebody's got to pick all of these apart. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have to do something to change this economy of plastic like this, this, this linear economy where they make the plastic, they, we use the plastic, we throw out the plastic. Because otherwise we're going to be buried in it. They're predicting now that by 2050 there will be more plastic than fish in the oceans. It'll be 20% of all the oil consumed will be consumed for plastic. And it'll be 15% of the CO2 going into the atmosphere. And this is the way we have it now, this linear system that the plastic is generated. The plastic is made from virgin feedstocks. It all goes here. 30% of it is lost into the water. 40% uh, of it is landfilled. 14% is incineration. And incineration is just basically burning fossil fuels straight. And only 14% collected for recycling and only hardly any of it actually done. So this linear process has to change. 95% of it is lost. More, I showed that one. These, a lot of these people are proposing what they call now a circular economy. And this, the circular economy is recycling's latest fraud. You're going to be hearing a lot about it because everybody's going to say that the circular economy is the way to go. But circular, and what they're doing, I, this is out of order, isn't it? No, I guess it isn't. Uh, the circular economy is projecting that, you know, we'll take the stuff back and we'll cook it and we'll decompose it and we'll process it and we'll take it back to the original components. But it's still got to be picked up. Somebody's got to throw it in the right place. It's still got to be take, picked up. It's got to be taken to the processor and it's got to be done. And that's still linear and a linear system doesn't want to be bent. What we have to do 
is actually change our culture and not our cups and not our processing. Uh, this photo is, you know, we have to start drinking coffee like an Italian. If you've ever been to Italy or an Italian cafe, you know, any time after 10 in the morning, you get a little espresso. In Italy, you get a little espresso in a little ceramic cup. You shoot it back, you put it down, they take it and wash it. There's none of this thing of going into Starbucks and getting the giant paper cup. Starbucks will sell you the giant paper cup because they know they're taking it out of the store. They don't have real estate. You're not filling up a seat. So therefore, they can make the cups bigger and bigger and bigger. Drink coffee like an Italian, you knock it back. Here's that circular. I don't know. Those were slightly out of order. So they're proposing take all this stuff, design the production so we can use it and reuse it and recycle it. But how is that different from what's happening today? They're saying they want to shift the system where it's circular, but it really isn't. So you'll hear more and more about the circular economy. But it's not a circular economy if you're taking plastic. And you can see how complicated they're calling the circular economy. And so here they're talking about using all of these different technologies to turn it back. So here they are, you know, we take them and they convert, con convert them into refined hydrocarbons, decompose them, purify them, mechanically separate them. All these different technologies that they're uh, proposing, all of these different things that they'll turn poly PET, your water bottle, into polymers and your polystyrene I see over there into naphtha and all of these things. But, as I said, it's just the plastics industry hijacking the idea of a circular economy to basically keep selling plastic and inventing stupid things like Tide Pods and more throwaway rubbish. This was always funny. Even, you know, if only nature, if only there was some way to protect these oranges so we didn't need to cover them in plastic. Or these bananas. Oh, if only. And what I always show is the stupidest concept that was ever developed, which is Tasmanian rainwater that is packed in disposable ice trays and shipped around the room, the world, so that you can put them in your freezer and have Tasmanian rainwater ice cubes in your drink. Like, how silly and extravagant is this? And of course, what I think also the silliest invention of the last 10 years, which is the coffee pot, which is instead of easily making yourself a cup of coffee with a press machine or something like that, it's all put into these little pods, which the companies all say, oh yes, this is how you recycle it. You simply peel it apart and you empty it and you recycle it and put the stuff in your recycling bin. But the fact of the matter is people are buying this for convenience. Now, I have never actually owned a Keurig machine, but I stayed in a hotel in Vancouver that had one, and I thought, well, let's try this. And so I tried to take apart that thing and recycle it myself. And it was insane. It was a mess. You have the plastic, you have the foil, you have the coffee, you have the filter. No one is going to be doing this. Anyone who says they does do this is lying because it's just a ridiculous process. But by saying, oh, if you do this, then it's compostable and it's recyclable, well, it's a fantasy. And so this is the kind of thinking, of design thinking, that we have to get away from, that, you know, this design for con this culture of convenience like this. The next thing that's taking over the world in terms of plastic is the whole food delivery craze. Because, you know, you've got Uber Eats now and Uber Eats and all these other companies delivering food, all with tons of plastic. In the States and in Canada, you've got special companies being set up just to make food for delivery. So, you know, Every one of them, who here's ordered Swiss Chalet? The amount of plastic that comes in a Swiss Chalet when you take it home is insane. And yet more and more people are eating this way in disposable plastic from these ghost kitchens, as they're called. They're even Rachel Ray announced this deal with Rachel Ray that they would basically from some of these phantom restaurants you could buy her food uh, packaged up delivered to your house in plastic of course and this is how we get buried in single-use plastic by these companies that simply want us to buy more and more of it so 
there's many good reasons to really resist using them all. They're made from fossil fuels, which have a huge carbon footprint. They'll still be around in 100 years. Hardly any of it's recycled. Uh, it leaches toxins. If it's got the phthalates in it, it causes hormone disruption. It pollutes our ocean. It kills mammals, and it enters our food chain. So just try to avoid it. And we should be trying to go seriously to a, a uh, zero waste economy, which we can do. It's not hard. Um, I have a friend uh, who's actually my editor and is also a, a really good photographer who's doing this plastic-free, no bottled plastic, no package at all for uh, the next six months. She's trying it. So she buys her soap like that you can get from Lush where it doesn't come wrapped in anything. She puts all of her shampoos and everything else. She buys them at a bulk store in returnable bottles, refillable bottles, uh, dishwashing block. All of these products you can find so that you don't need plastic packaging. And we have to start thinking this is the true circular economy where you design things so that they can be repaired and fixed, uh, so that they can be returned and de de disassembled, recycled, and manufactured in a green environment. This is an old uh, 